I'm delighted to welcome you here today for the media briefing about the BIS's quarterly, uh, March quarterly review. With me today are Claudio Borio, Head of the Monetary and Economic Department, and Hyun Song Shin, Economic Advisor and Head of Research. Thank you, Jill, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. In this uh, quarterly review, uh, we examine financial market development from the 25th of November to the 26th of uh, February. The central theme of the period was the waxing and waning of the gap between central banks' cautious stance on the one hand and financial markets' more optimistic expectations about the policy outlook on, on the other. The tension resulted in swings in both directions as one side or the other dominated market moves. This was a key driver of volatility, particularly in bond markets. Towards the end of uh, last year, central banks' success in bringing down inflation fueled market expectations of early cuts. Disinflation was proceeding smoothly, and a soft or softish landing seemed to be well in sight. As a result, market participants got ahead of themselves, and their expectations drifted away from central banks' more cautious messages. Policymakers pushed back to dispel excessive optimism, reaffirming that it was too early to declare victory in the fight against inflation. This was underscored by data releases in January pointing to stubborn price pressures. Central banks' efforts to bring market expectations back in line eventually succeeded and the daylight narrowed substantially. Volatility in government bond markets remained historically high during the review period. This does tend to happen around turning points in the policy cycle when bond yield volatility can easily exceed equity price volatility. But the recent difference between the two has been larger and longer lasting than usual. The sanguine views of market participants translated into easier financial conditions. Risk assets rallied in both advanced and emerging market economies. The exception was China, as the economy struggled further with strains in the real estate sector. The rally in equity markets became more broad-based, even as it propelled valuations of AI and tech stocks to ever loftier heights. Corporate spreads narrowed, continuing the journey they had embarked on in late 2022. That said, <clears throat> the picture was not uniformly rosy. As has been the case for quite some time now, buoyant pricing contrasted with banks' cautious lending attitudes, rather subdued bond issuance and rising corporate defaults. Mixed messages were also coming from foreign exchange markets. The dollar initially depreciated before appreciating markedly from January onwards, in response to signs of later than expected rate cuts. This pattern indicates that exchange rate movements reflected mostly revisions to the monetary policy outlook rather than risk sentiment as such. In conclusion, recent developments allow us to look at the future with cautious optimism. Central banks have taken decisive action and thus prevented inflation from becoming entrenched. At the same time, economic activity has been remarkably resilient and the financial system has held up well. Even so, risks have not gone away, and we cannot be complacent. Policymakers remain committed to completing the last mile of the disinflation journey. The overview also includes boxes that delve deeper into the theme of volatility, uncertainty, and vulnerabilities. One box examines the evolution of disagreement among professional forecasters over the future path of interest rates. Another looks at trading strategies that may have amplified the compression of equity volatility. A third one explores vulnerabilities in the nexus between banks in their capacity as primary brokers and hedge funds. Let me now turn to Hyun, who will present some of the other highlights of the CC. Thank you, Claudia. <clears throat> The special features in this quarterly review cover a range of topics. Two are on macro monetary themes, uh, the first being the sectoral drivers of inflation, and the other being on the so-called natural rate of interest, or R star. Other topics include the design and adoption of fast payment systems and liquidity in emerging market sovereign bond markets. <laughs> 
We also kick off a series on the BIS banking and financial statistics with a primer on the differences between the locational and nationality perspectives. And let me say a few words on each of them. The piece by Pongpich Amachakul, Denise Egan, and Marco Lombardi investigates the sectoral drivers of post, -pand uh, of post pandemic inflation. They find that the importance of services prices has increased in driving the trajectory in inflation, and price increases of services has been slower to moderate than that of goods. And this is so even excluding food and energy. A larger contribution from services may make inflation more stubborn in the near term, as services price growth is structurally more persistent. There is also a longer term consideration if services prices rise faster to catch up with pre-pandemic relative price trends between goods and services, overall inflation will be harder to arrest. In a second special feature, Gianluca Benigno, Boris Hoffman, Galo Nuno, and Damiano Sandri examine estimates of the so-called natural rate of interest, or R star, for the US and euro area. They find that several alternative estimates of R star show that it may have increased uh, since the pre-pandemic period, but there are substantial differences across the different estimates and wide statistical margins of uncertainty within each measure. Factors like weak growth and longer life expectancy and longer life expectancy push R star down, while fiscal imbalances pull it up. Additionally, monetary policy may also exert some influence on R star making it endogenous. The high degree of uncertainty surrounding estimates of R star and its underlying drivers means that we need to put this notion in the right context. In particular, monetary policy should not depend too sensitively on any particular estimate of R star. In the special feature on fast payment systems, John Frost, Priscilla Ku Wilkins, Annika Kossa, but Salashriti and Carolina Velasquez find that the degree of adoption of fast payments depends on several design features. Higher usage occurs when the system is provided and managed by the central bank as compared to a private infrastructure. And in addition, adoption is higher when non-banks participate in the system, possibly due to greater competition. And when the system puts greater weight on a range of different use cases, um, also, uh, the usage is just higher. In the fourth feature, Bernardo Stornik, John Frost, Rafael Guerra, Christian Upper, and Alexander Tombini discuss the factors that promote liquid and resilient bond markets for emerging market sovereign bonds. They find that the investor base and size of hedging markets matter for the liquidity and resilience of sovereign bond markets. Domestic banks seem to mitigate the impact of external shocks on market liquidity, particularly during times of market stress. Conversely, a greater share of bonds held by foreign investors is associated with a larger impact on markets arising from external liquidity shocks. Finally, let me highlight an important new series of articles designed as a sequence of introductory chapters to a primer on the rationale and use of BIS banking and financial statistics. We're kicking off the series in this quarterly review uh, with a piece by Patrick Maguire, Gertz von Peter, and Sonia Ju, who provide a review on the nationality perspective in financial statistics, which is based on the jurisdiction of the headquarters, rather than the traditional residence-based approach, which is based on the location of the economic activity. The nationality perspective has a long history at the BIS and provides useful complementary information to traditional residence-based statistics. The nationality perspective is better suited for understanding the activity of financial firms that have an international footprint, so that notions such as balance sheet exposure be the consolidated perspective. And the article shows how this shift in perspective provides valuable insights on many issues, for instance, foreign currency debt, deglobalization, financial centers, and financial openness. Thank you very much, Hyun and Claudio. So we're now open for questions. So I see a hand raised from Tim Wallace. 
Hello. Um, thank you for the uh, presentation. I, I wanted to ask how serious the um, volatility in bond markets is for um, government finances, for fiscal policy. Obviously, countries like the UK have got some um, pretty large debts at the minute and uh, are also um, quite tight when it comes to finding, finding extra money. So I, I wonder if the um, swings around in bond markets are um, having um, what you might think of as sort of serious policy effects or serious um, re real economy effects, so to speak. Thank Thanks, you. Tim. Well, thank you. Well, at present, uh, we haven't seen any any particular effect uh, in the pricing of, of bond yields. I mean, in fact, if you look at the at the overall shift in bond yields over the period, they roughly ended up where they where they started. Uh, of course, one can rule out the possibility that more serious uh, episodes of volatility could could have an impact. But let me stress that what we have seen so far is rather, if you like, physiological. It, it does tend to happen around. Uh, times of uh, turning, as I mentioned, turns in the, in the policy, policy cycle, and it's quite natural because people are trying to guess when the next rate cut is going to be, where the interest rate is going to land after a period of having been higher, after having been much lower for much longer. So, as I said, this is quite natural, it's physiological, it's, it's not pathological. Thank you very much. Next question from Elena Bronzati from Agencia Estado. I have two questions. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, some inflation data surprised in the U.S. and Brazil recently. How concerned about that are you? And what's the impact, possible impact on the rate cuts in both cases, please? And my second question is about the, the emerging market sovereign bonds. Brazil's debt relative to GDP is the biggest in emerging markets, right? Behind only the US and France. What's your view about Brazil's fiscal situation? I mean, how worried about these are you? Thank you so much. Well, thank you. <clears throat> um, in fact, broadly speaking, the, the last pieces of information uh, have come out in line with uh, expectations. Uh, now, in general, I mean, we, we, as as I clearly said, and maybe we can get into this in more detail when we discuss one of the special features, I don't want to preempt that to the extent that there is a question about the inflation risks ahead, because we tend to see them as particularly related to the interaction between goods and uh, service prices and uh, wages. Um, I would say that, broadly speaking, uh, we are on the right path. Uh, things are proceeding well. There are risks ahead to inflation, and uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the fight against inflation is not yet won. There will be differences across countries, but in general, it's important for the central banks to remain vigil vigilant and, and nimble. Thank you, Alina. Maybe I can just have a follow-up to the first part as well. Um, the special feature on the sectoral drivers of inflation uh, is definitely worth a read if you have the time uh, to, to take a look at that, because it does put some uh, very important context to this idea that the last mile uh, is actually very important in the fight against inflation. I think one of the reasons that um, inflation might be a little bit more stubborn than it, uh, uh, than it at one point seemed could be because uh, of the relative stickiness of uh, services prices, services price growth versus the, the, the goods um, uh, price trajectory. Um, if you also look at the special feature, what we, uh, I, mean, <clears throat> I mean, the basic fact, which I also described in my remarks, is that services prices tend to be stickier uh, because it has much more uh, non-tradable components. Uh, there is a much larger uh, labor component. But also there's a very um, uh, important fact in that the pandemic basically um, put the relative uh, price levels between goods and services out of whack. And uh, what the special feature describes is, uh, you know, if services prices were to increase to catch up with the pre-pandemic trend, it could even make that, um, that uh, uh, stickiness of inflation, uh, you know, even more so. So I think that's probably uh, something that uh, would put more context to the uh, discussion on the last mile. 
Um, on the second question on emerging market sovereign bonds, let me answer more broadly. As, as Jill says, with, we don't comment on individual economies. I think um, emerging market sovereign bonds, and this is something that you know we've looked at very closely over the years, and uh, one of the uh, really uh, positive developments in, in recent years, in recent decades, in fact, has been that emerging market sovereigns have been able to borrow in their own currencies. And that's given them uh, quite a bit of flexibility in their, uh, in their fiscal space. And they've actually used it pretty conservatively. They've used it pretty prudently uh, for the reasons that you uh, point out, because um, the um, you know, that fiscal space has to be used prudently uh, or else uh, the sovereign bond market could be under stress. And so what we found during the very um, uh, difficult period in financial markets, um, you know, as rates were going up in 2022, uh, in fact, it was the emerging markets who actually came out much better than even many of the advanced economies. So, for example, um, you know, if you if you read the, you know, many of our publications, you see that in fact, relative to advanced economies, emerging markets actually did pretty well, uh, both in terms of their exchange rate, but also in terms of uh, you know their their growth picture as well. So, I think this is uh, um, I think a cause for uh, some optimism, although certainly not, for, uh, but certainly not for you know complacency. Uh, and I think it is, uh, I think, a reflection of the lessons that have been learned uh, by emerging market policymakers. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, a next question from Aidan Reiter of the Financial Times. I just wanted to ask a follow-up on that sectoral price dynamic. I was just curious in the wake of, you know, de-risking and, you know, different trends in trade and core price good growth, that you really expect um, services to, you know, resume its upward trend or it's up higher uh, price growth over core goods. Leo, I think if you can take that question, please. You, you are talking about, if I understood correctly, you are talking about the outlook for the price of services. Yes, outlook <clears throat> for the price of services. As you know, trade has with China and trade between the West and other countries has potentially caused core prices growth to go yeah. up in the coming years. Do you expect the same dynamic with sectoral prices of services versus core goods to remain the same? No, right. Um, well, if you actually look at the, uh, if you look at the literature on uh, this issue of the relative price of services versus goods, I mean, the main reason uh, that people argue there could be a structural trend between the two is on the one hand that as countries get richer, and this is something true globally, um, uh, the, the people tend to prefer shift from goods to services, and that's a question of their underlying preferences, consumption preferences. That's one factor. So that tends to increase all else equal the demand for services relative to the demand for goods, point number one. Point number two is the fact that productivity growth in general in the service sector is slower than in the uh, goods sector, partly because of... Uh, greater uh, labor intensity. And point three, which is the third ingredient that you need to have for this story to hold, is that the wages, uh, wage growth in the two sectors does not uh, adjust to compensate for the productivity trends. Now, all, this, all these factors that were, uh, are likely to, if you just look at these three factors that I mentioned, they are long-term structural forces that are likely to remain in train going forward. Now, having said all that, um, it is indeed true that one of the factors that we have emphasized also over the years has helped in the disinflationary process, producing longer-term secular disinflationary pressures, was the uh, globalization and effectively uh, the big increase in uh, the global labor force, effective labor force and the entry into the labor force of a pool of labor which was cheaper than the one in advanced economies. Now, that factor over time has tended to wane, and all else equal, we expect that that type of tailwind on disinflation could, could become a, uh, a headwind. So far, you're right in saying that this could be a, a trend, but in practice, uh, we haven't seen uh, big changes in uh, 
the fragmentation or in the, in the degree of integration of the global economy. We have, been, we have seen changes in the structure of global value chains, and maybe Hyun can elaborate on that, but, um, which may have lengthened the chains, but we haven't quite seen a, a big change in the degree of integration as of yet, as of yet. This may be, Aiden, if I can just add one more thing. It's, uh, it's graph seven of the um, Amatya Kul, Egon, and Lombardi uh, feature. That's the figure that shows how um, the relative prices, so price levels of goods and services, I mean, has this upper trend that, um, uh, that uh, Claudia mentions. Um, and I think, um, I mean, this is clearly um, uh, of great importance, you know, when we think about the overall trajectory. I think if we neglect the the composition, it's, um, you know, it's going to, uh, you know, wrong footers. And um, I think it's important. Um, uh, I'm, what this special feature does show is that it's, it's uh, important to keep that sectoral dimension in mind when we uh, think about the last mile. Thank you very much. And the next question, I think it's James McIntosh from the Wall Street Journal, if you want to. Hi. Hi, yeah. Um, uh, two, two questions. The first on the uh, markets. Um, Claudio, you, you rightly, quite rightly pointed out the markets have been obsessed for the past year about uh, every, every central bank um, uh, their prospect of cuts. Um, until this year, um, where the, they've, you know, bond markets have priced out uh, much of what they had expected in terms of cuts. Fed, they've gone from six cuts to three cuts. Um, but the stock market doesn't seem to care. Um, and connected with that, there's lots of talk of bubbles. Um, uh, and I'd be interested if you could just talk about that a bit. Um, it, obviously, most obvious in the US. And then second question, um, just on the goods versus services. Of course, that, that relative price trend was partly because goods prices kept falling. Why do you think that the why, why are you worried that it'll be services prices going up rather than goods prices correcting back to their pre pandemic trend and falling a lot further? Okay, they're both audio questions, so please. Okay, first question. Um, Yes, indeed. Uh, I think uh, we are seeing that uh, risk asset prices in general uh, is not just uh, the stock market; is also the corporate uh, corporate spreads have been quite uh, quite buoyant, and um, so the, the clearly uh, they see a very very soft landing, uh, very soft landing ahead. There is no question about that. Um, in terms of the stock market, in particular. I think it's no news that whenever you have big uh, changes in uh, or prospective changes in in technology, you get these uh, huge uh, runs of enthusiasm that uh, propel the market to extreme heights. Um, we may we may be seeing that uh, again. Now, from the point of view of the macroeconomy, however, which is really what the central banks care most about, it, it's not so much. The stock market is not so much the price of a few companies that that really matters. It's uh, if I were to choose one one asset price, I would I would focus more on real estate prices, housing and commercial real estate for somewhat different reasons, which tend to be those that are more closely related to the macroeconomic outlook. Um, on the uh, services versus goods. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are good reasons uh, to think that the relative price uh, of services uh, will be increasing compared to that of goods, core goods. That's the focus of the, of the special feature. Um, uh, what will happen to the absolute level of prices? That's, uh, that's another question. That, of course, partly depends on monetary policy uh, itself, which uh, is targeting the overall uh, level of uh, rate of change in prices. Um, so I think it's, it's very important to keep the distinction between the relative price and the general price level. Uh, when thinking about these things, it's clearly true. It's clearly true that, to the extent that, to the extent that, um, the uh, globalization forces that I was mentioning earlier uh, 
these in, which are disinflationary are not going to may not be operating with the same strength in the future as they did in the past then all else equal one would expect the environment to become more inflationary in the context of the change in that relative price that i mentioned earlier by the way if we have some time it is not just the relative price of uh, core goods and services which is the focus of the special feature which matters but there is another relative price which is equally important and that's the real wages and that's the relative price of nominal wages uh, in relation to the general price level and that too uh, we should bear that in mind when we're thinking about the prospects of inflation going forward because it's the interaction between the two and also real wages have tended to fall uh, fall relative to their previous trend in, uh, increase, which, by the way, was rather sluggish already in the past. And because uh, services are more labor intensive, is, uh, the link between the, the adjustment in these two relative prices is, uh, is, is very tight and they tend to reinforce each other. Um, and this is one of the reasons, going back to Hume's point about the persistence higher persistence of, uh, of, uh, in the prices of services. The key reason there is precisely because they're more labor intensive and wages tend to be more persistent than prices. Thank you very much, Claudio. Um, we have another raised hand from Mark Jones from Reuters. So I had a kind of follow up question to James slightly. You know, you were talking about the asset prices, but also you were saying about um, in, in the overview in general about the, 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 the kind of daylight narrowing between the markets and the central banks do, do you think they've got it ultimately about right now um that, that's the first question and also um you, you touched on property for a different reason but you know the market is concerned about commercial real estate too and i know you've touched on it in past reports um is a is that something that we we should still be concerned about and the, and the final question is you know if if we're on the right path now as you say in terms of inflation going into the second half of the year um, with, so many, with so many big um, elections coming up. How volatile could that be potentially? I don't think we get into predicting the outcome of elections, but the other, the first two questions, I think, are, are, are two for Claudio, please. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, on, on the daylight, well, as, as I mentioned in my remarks, indeed, and, and as some of you pointed out, and you have, uh, again, emphasized towards uh, the end of the period, this daylight that existed between central banks' uh, messages, communication, and, uh, and financial markets have uh, narrowed substantially. Exactly where it is, uh, as you know, not, not all central banks, well, very few central banks are actually providing projections, detailed projections of an interest rate. So it's not that easy to compare the two. But roughly speaking, as we say, the, the daylight has uh, substantially narrowed. That, I think, in, in, in general, should be, should be a good thing. And, uh, it's, uh, and the fact that financial markets have converged on central bank views suggests that, uh, on this occasion at least, central banks... Uh, uh, had a better appreciation of the risks ahead than the financial markets. But by the way, I think it is very useful to have this kind of dialectic between financial markets and and central banks. If uh, financial markets were to take every single word that the central banks say as being the future, they they would not be providing any independent information to, uh, for financial for central banks' decisions on commercial real estate. Yes, as you said, we have talked about it for for quite some time. Uh, in the past, I have also mentioned that what we had seen had uh, so far had been the uh, materialization of uh, interest rate risk and the materialization of credit risk was still to come. Commercial real estate is is part of that uh, picture. Compared with house prices, commercial real estates are less important for as a macroeconomic phenomenon because they are have less of an have an impact on a smaller um, part of economic activity than house prices do, but they can have a, a more specific targeted impact on financial institutions and and banks. If you look historically. The main sources of, uh, of losses for banks have, have actually not been house prices, which were in the GFC, but commercial real estate. Think, for example, of what happened in the early 90s around the world. Now, having said all this, having said all this, 
commercial real estate has been, if there is one asset class that has been on the radar screen of uh, supervisors and banks for a long time, it's precisely commercial real estate. So, yes, we could see problems. Yes, we could see some banks uh, having difficulties. But from the broader picture, broader picture, I think that we're starting initial conditions in terms of the attention that was being paid to, to this uh, problem, to this known, known risk is, um, is, a good, is a good place to start. Thank you very much. Another raised hand from Greg Quinn from Market News. Hello. Oh, uh, I have a question about the, the R-Star paper. In particular, it shows a, a wide divergence, like two percentage points between the different estimates. I wondered if you could explain uh, why those estimates diverge so much and if they've become larger or smaller uh, recently. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, in fact, if you look at graph two um, of the special feature, I, I think you'll uh, you'll get a sort of, you know, bird's eye view of uh, what's been happening. Um, the special feature looks at how our star has uh, been evolving in the US and the Euro area, and that's because of uh, data availability reasons. Um, and as you say, um, we do see quite a big divergence in our star, depending on which, um, you know, measure you choose. Um, uh, most of them have been creeping up, uh, but that's not universal. Um, you know, one of them shows um, actually a, a decline. Um, I think uh, the issue here is that, um, you know, our star as an abstract concept um, is pretty clear. You know, we can you know, define it in a way that, you know, makes perfect sense. But um, it relies on this idea of um, a hypothetical. So we're saying, well, in the absence of shocks, what would be the uh, the interest rate um, that the economy would gravitate towards, or you know, would be uh, you know settling at? And of course, you know, in the real world, we always have shocks, uh, and so this uh, is a bit of a mythical you know hypothetical. And so we need to find different ways of uh, getting at this number. Uh, so there are different approaches to measuring it. Um, so one of them could be a purely theoretical one. Uh, you know, one could also mix a theoretical and uh, an empirical measurement type of exercise, or it could be you know something that's really relying very much on the uh, on the econometrics. That's to let the data speak. And because of the different approaches, um, we we do see quite a bit of divergence in the. Um, uh, in the numbers that actually come up if you uh, if you go through these exercises, um, and I think the other point also worth uh, stressing is that within each of these different methods of measurement, we do see a very wide range of uncertainty in the statistical um, uh, in a margin for error, you know, as well. So um, I think the conclusion from this type of exercise is, is that you know while it's a very useful um, you know, theoretical notion. Um, it's going to be very difficult to utilize it in a very concrete way when we, uh, you know, conduct monetary policy, uh, because you know it is it is something that uh, is um, subject to this very, uh, you know, wide um, uh, range of different estimates. And so, um, if it's monetary policy that you're concerned with, uh, it's better that you conduct monetary policy rather than. Uh, you know, having this intermediate step of saying, you know, what is our star, and then think about monetary policy. Uh, so I, th I think that's that's the conclusion that comes out uh, from this from this exercise. And uh, I think uh, Claudia, you want to come in? No, let, let, let me let me be very very brief and just summarize what Hume said by saying that very much like beauty, our star is in the eyes of the beholder. <laughs>